Very good. We got quite a few people coming in, but we'll we'll go ahead and get started. So, first off, um, to everyone who's coming in, thanks for for joining. This is our third um, third webinar in the series. Uh, yesterday, we had uh, Matt Martin on, who was who was huge in developing the scouting network here in the United States for Major League Soccer, and um, is doing scouting now, uh, a bit of scouting with some European clubs as well, and. Uh, on Tuesday, we had Jimmy Conrad, the Glens first team coach, um, U.S. Men's National Team former captain, um, going over how to develop a, a style of play on the defensive side of the ball. Um, today, we have a discussion with goalkeeper Roy Carroll. Uh, he's going to share his journey in football and what it took for him to rise from the lower leagues of English football all the way to playing for the likes of Strauss Ferguson at, at Manchester United and getting capped uh, 45 times by uh, Northern Ireland national team. So. Roy, first, uh, how are you doing this evening? And I, I'm assuming you're in Northern Ireland, is that right? That's correct, Mike. Yeah, I'm back home here in Northern Ireland, just so outside Belfast. So everything's good, apart from you no know, coaching at the moment. It's difficult times for everybody at the moment. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, look, I, I appreciate you taking the time to speak with us. Um, we have a really good audience um, uh, waiting to hear about your experience and career and seeing what you've done um, uh, throughout your career. So let's start from the beginning, Roy. As a young player, were you always wanting to be a footballer? And, and what do you think made you stand out, you know, from the other players? Yeah, I think, I think uh, when I was growing up, I was basically was playing all over the park. Uh, I was in, in and out of goals. And uh, basically, I was more like a striker when I was younger. But uh, I made a step up to be a goalkeeper when I was uh, 14 years old. And uh, I just my, my dad was a, a goalkeeper, and I went stopped watching him when I was fourteen. Decided to be a keeper, and I haven't looked back since. I just love, just love diving around and be, making big saves. Sometimes you you can't make big saves, so uh, it's sometimes it's disappointing. But that's that's what makes you the person you are as a goalkeeper. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I was a goalkeeper as well, and uh, I. I didn't grow to I didn't have the, obviously a very good career um, I played in college but I never got to I wasn't a very tall goalkeeper either so if you'd have told me when I was younger if I was bigger than everyone um, that I would have been, end up being five five ten I'd have probably chose a different uh, different position but um, one thing we see here in the United States is that the parents I feel like discourage their kids from from playing in goals and um, I don't know if that's the same same in Europe uh, or in the UK, but you know, a lot of parents, especially at the younger ages, you know, they they want their kid to be out on the field, and and they say that you know they're not getting enough exercise to play in goal and stuff. So, I mean, what what do you think about that? And at what what age do you think it's important to start focusing on if you want to be a goalkeeper that that's that's the position you're going to be? Yeah, that's a good question, mate. The the, the biggest uh, situation over here, I've got a goalkeeping school in Northern Ireland, and. The parents are pushing the kids to, 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 to learn from me as a goalkeeping coach. So I haven't been, I haven't came across that situation when parents saying or oh, play out field to the kids. It's mostly uh, being a goalkeeper is a, is the main thing what I'm doing for these young keepers. But right. I do understand uh, for me, as I said before, I never really started concentrating 100 until I was 14 years old. So I think it's very important for young keepers. To understand the game, so playing different positions when you're a certain age, uh, it's it's good. It's good to have uh, your your technique when you're a certain age as a goalkeeper, but you can still play outfield because that's the way the football's going. And especially in Europe, is uh, you have to be sometimes you have to be fantastic with your feet, and that's the way football's turning out to be all over the world. It's playing out from the back. So if you're just standing goals uh, since you're six or seven, nine years old, whatever age uh, under ten. I haven't got that. I haven't got that opportunity to play. What's it like playing outfield? Because right. that's what I did when I was younger. I thought I was like someone like uh, Ronaldo when I was young. You know what I mean? It was like uh, I was the best striker you ever seen in your life when I was when I was like uh, ten to thirteen years old. And uh, it helps. It helps you. To, it helps you to get, especially at staying age, to uh, to to understand the game more and play and be comfortable with the ball at your feet, which is very important at staying age. Yeah, absolutely. I, I couldn't agree more. Um, so how did you switch from playing the, the club football in Northern Ireland and then making, making the move over to, I think it was Hull City? How did that come about? It was a few years ago when I was only uh, 16 years old. I was playing for a uh, the men's team uh, in my local area. And uh, we, played, we played a team in Belfast and there was, there was a scout 
who was actually playing against me. He was a striker. So it was a strange them days. It was he was a scout, but he was he was a striker playing against me. And uh, we we lost the game five one. And uh, he came up and started speaking to me. And uh, he just said, Roy, we thought we th- I thought you did well. Uh, he scored three goals against me, so I thought he was joking, yeah, k- kidding around. <laughs> but then he was being serious. He was being serious, Mike. It was a funny. It was surreal. Uh, at the time when he came up and spoke to me, because when you left five goals and you're disappointed, but uh, he said, your attitude was really good. Would you fancy going for a trials at uh, Hull City at the time? So I was only 16. I was only 16 at the time. And I turned 17 and uh, went over to Hull City for a trial. And was there for a week. Really enjoyed it. Learned a lot when I was a young lad, especially coming out from Northern Ireland. And uh, about... A month later, I got a phone call and they said, we want, we want you to sign you as a scholarship. In them days, it was called the YTS for the youth set up, so it was. And uh, I moved over there, signed a two-year contract, and that was it, really. Uh, I just moved back home there three years ago, uh, so I've been away for quite a long time. But that's how I developed. Uh, I was playing men's football when I was 16 years old, so I grew, I grew up very quickly to be a goalkeeper, back, especially back in them days. Uh, in the lower leagues are very difficult, uh, very, very, very uh, what's the word? It's uh, for a lot of contact back in them days, goalkeepers. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, uh, playing a young age as a goalkeeper against men over in Northern Ireland made me grow up very quick. So it was, it was a good experience playing, playing against men at uh, 16 years old. No, I can imagine. It, it seems like a, a lot of stories from, from players, especially over in, in Europe and in the UK, um, you know, they get seen by chance and it's, it's these Sunday league games, it's these men's leagues games that they, that they are, they're playing in and that there happens to be a scout there and then that the rest is history, right? I mean, we don't get that very much in the United States. Oh, you, you, you hit, uh, hit the nail on the head there. That's what we say in the United Kingdom. It was sometimes you might have, a, a, you might know the scouts there, but them scouts might not fancy you, you know what I mean? So you never give up, you never give up. And uh, especially in my day, there wasn't that many scouts around the time. Like I said to the story, the scout was a striker, so he was playing every Saturday. So who, who, whoever he plays against, he was the scout, you know what I mean? So that's, that's the way it was back in them days. So you do need a bit of luck. You need a bit of luck in, in the game to be in the right place at the right time. And I was in the right place at the right time at the time. Right. Interesting. Um, and, then, and then I moved to, I moved to uh, Wigan. Um, and you played, you had a successful four years, I think it was, at Wigan. Um, were they... The whole city, when you came in, they were in the second division. And when you moved to Wigan, where, where were they? I t- uh, when I was uh, back, in, back in them days, hey, Mike, it was like you had uh, the top league, League One, League Two, League Three. So uh, we were in League Three. Wigan just got promoted that year. Hull City, where they had a lot of financial problems. So they've put all the players up for sale. And Wigan was getting promoted because they won the league about three weeks before the season. So my opportunity was go to Wigan or stay at Hull City and see what happens. Hopefully the club would get saved. But the situation with me, I moved on because Wigan paid a lot of money for me to go in them days. It saved Hull City. So I done. I was good for Hull City selling me, saved the club. The club went on, played in the Premier League, but I moved to Wigan then and uh, they got promoted. So uh, the next year, that's when I was uh, okay to play because my contract was ready to go for the next season. So they got promoted to League, league Two at the time. And uh, I played many games. I played many games uh, with uh, Wigan. I think Wigan was the most uh, games I've ever played over my career at one club. So I have a, I have a soft spot at Wigan because I met a lot of good people there and the, the experience uh, made me stronger, um, especially moving away from Northern Ireland. I was nervous moving in the whole city away from a small village into a big city and then I'm moving again uh, after two years which I was nervous again because you don't know what's going to happen as a young person I was 19 years old when I moved to Wigan and it was I think it was eight, sorry I was 18 when I moved to Wigan so it was, it was still very young a young lad and uh, uh, but it made me a stronger person because I met I've opened up I have spoke to my teammates at Wigan and I started Chapman and more relaxed, and it's made me feel str- uh, stronger with working with Wigan Athletic at the time. Right, right. And then, did you know uh, when you were at Wigan that Manchester United was was interested in you, and how how did that come about? Uh, it was uh, it was a long story, but I'm not going to bore you. Like, but it was one of these situations. 
Wigan was playing an old, uh, an old stadium and uh, our, our owner built a new stadium. So Manchester United came to open it uh, just in pre-season, just before the season started. And uh, I played for the first 45 minutes. And the situation was like two years later, I got a phone call and said Manchester United was interested in me. But uh, it, was, it was one of those situations uh, when I went to speak to Sir Alex Ferguson, when I moved to Manchester United, he spoke, we spoke about what, how long he was watching me. He was watching me for two years, which was, wow. I thought, Gee, that's, that's a long time. That's a long time. And uh, uh, it was still, it was still so, so very unreal when you're speaking to a man like Sir Alex, uh, who's won everything in the game, because I think they won the treble in 99. This was 2000, 2001 when I went to Manchester United. So two years ago, I was just watching him on TV winning the treble and then at 23 years old you're sitting there talking to one of the best managers in the world unbelievable unbelievable it was a, it was a it was a strange situation when he said when he said to me he was watching you for two years and you think to yourself how did i play in them two years you know what i mean you just start thinking silly things in your head uh, yeah. thinking i must have done it must have been okay because sometimes i'm that type of guy from northern Ireland, just so laid back uh I just take everything on the chin and get on with it. And uh, wherever I work hard to try, I always wanted to be a goalkeeper, a professional goalkeeper. I got that opportunity for Hull City. Then I, and my next step was to push myself as far as I can. How high can I go? And the opportunity came to, uh, I think it was about six years later, came with a move to Manchester United. Unbelievable. Um, and, and when you went to United in 2001, um, you, had, you had players that came in with you, like Diego Forlan, I think Ruud van Nistelrooy was, was transferred that year. Uh, Laurent Blanc, uh, what an incredible, and add to the existing players of David Beckham, Roy Keane, um, Gary Neville, Ryan Giggs, like the, the training, the, that training environment and that the culture just must have been something exceptional. Yeah, uh, I think the most important thing for me to realize what, what the club was all about was uh, when I walked in that first training session, how high intensity the training was. Everything was high tempo, high tempo all the time. Fast movements, fast, fast movements. And when you look around the training ground, sometimes you have to pinch yourself. You see David Beckham, you see the likes of Paul Scholes, Ryan Giggs, Roy Keane, and you think to yourself, this is unbelievable. Uh, and uh, I look back now and it's great memories, what, what you can have when you grow up, when you, when you finish from playing football. And Sorry, something happened there. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yep, hear you fine, yep. Sorry. So uh, I look back and it's great memories, but it's made me, it's made me the person I am because the, the hunger to win even the five-a-side games in training, it was very intense, even the little five-a-side games. Uh, if you lose, you, it's, it depends who's in your team, you know what I mean? Right. If you had Roy Keane in your team, you, you could be getting a, an ear bashful from Roy Keane. But, even uh, in training? Enough, we, even in training. That, that's, that was, that's what Manchester United was all about, the Temple, when I was there for um, four years. Uh, uh, the discipline and getting everything right and getting everything uh, prepared for the game on a Saturday to win games. Uh, we, we could go out and win games 4-3, you know what I mean? When I was playing for Manchester United, I might have let a goal in, but in your back of your mind, you said, we have the quality of the players like Ruud van Nistelrooy who came in, Ronaldo who came in, uh, all them top quality players. We're going to we're gonna get goals. So that's, that's what Manchester United was, an attacking football team. Who Sir Alex Ferguson always wanted an attacking team, yeah. and uh, we had that. We had them back in the days then. But it was those some. Are, it was some glory uh, days. <laughs> uh, glory days, but it's, it happens in football. What ha what's happening with Manchester United at the moment? Uh, same as Liverpool. Liverpool went through a really bad time, and then Man City came up and started winning games and winning leagues, and then Chelsea winning leagues. It's just, it's just the way football is. But it's the way it's the way you bounce back from it and. Uh, hopefully Manchester United will come back stronger than like the like the way in the in the late nineties and the early early two thousands. Yeah, I mean, just just staying on that, I guess. Um, you know, it seems like uh, Ole Ole's trying to trying to do things a bit differently than the way than Jose and, and Van Gaal did, and trying to bring back that culture into Manchester United. And it seems his transfer policy maybe is um, is a less scattergun than than the other ones. It actually seems like there's a bit more. Um, thought process behind it. What, what do you do? You think? Do you see United getting back to to winning ways and being able to to, to challenge for the title? 
uh, the the biggest problem uh, for any club, any any big clubs around the world, you you have to go and get a player who who can come in and play for Manchester United or play, come in and play for Barcelona, because you could go out and buy the best player at one club. Say you go and buy a player at uh, I don't know, say Aston Villa, and he's probably one of the best players at Aston Villa. But when you go to Manchester United, there it's a completely different ball game. It's a different ball game when you play for Manchester United. You got the pressure of the press. You got the pressure of uh, playing in front of seventy thousand fans, and you have to win. And uh, I think for me, uh, playing for Manchester United made me made me a strong person because I came in. Everybody was looking for Peter Schmeichel, uh, and that that was the my that was the biggest problem going in as a goalkeeper because you can never get another a goalkeeper like Peter Schmeichel. He's a one off. Right. Uh, like Fabian Bartes won everything in the world. They won won all trophies. And he was even put under pressure because everybody wants another Peter Smeichel. So for me, Manchester United uh, has to look uh, in the scouting role by going out, seeing the players' discipline, what's he like, his attitude. Uh, would he be good enough to come to Manchester United and be strong for the for the cause for Man U? Because every game you play in, everybody wants to be at Man U. Even now, they still want to be at Manchester United. Uh, so that's that's what. It is. It's no no point going in Manchester United and thinking second place is better than first. No way. Right. You have to be there and pushing it for yourself for number one. Right. We have a, we have a few questions that came in. Um, uh, Stralix Ferguson. Uh, do you have any stories of Stralix Ferguson's man management or any examples of of how he managed? His man management was um, his coaching. He, he didn't he didn't take the coaching. That's one thing I've learned as well when I went to Manchester United, because every other club I was at before I went to Man U, was the manager took the coaching. So so Alex was, was the manager. He he would have just walked around, speak to the players during training sessions. His man management was great, especially with me when I was a young player. Uh, spoke to me nearly every day, asked me how I'm doing. Uh, was really good. But the thing with Sir Alex as well, if you, don't get on the wrong side of him because that's when he puts his foot down, you know what I mean? So yeah. that's that's why he has so much respect in the game. He has so much respect in the game. Like uh, I remember sitting in uh, teams all over Europe like, and all the players are talking at half-time. But when I was at Manchester United, when Sir so Alex walked in, everybody kept quiet because he's the boss. He's the boss, you know what I mean? But everybody respected him because he gave the players respect. And, and that's the thing what uh, he, he always looked out for the players and uh, even on TV when he, we have a defeat he might, he blames himself and, and that's what the type of money is he, he never wants to put the pressure on the players because the players go out there and perform on the pitch and if you put too much pressure on players uh, it will definitely stop them from doing that performance on the pitch Yeah how was is, how is the relationship I mean obviously it's soured towards the end there and it still is between Roy, Roy Keane and, and Sir Alex but in those in that time it seemed like you know Roy Keane, I mean, he was obviously he was obviously the eyes and ears on on the pitch. Like, how was he as a leader in, in his relationship with Sir Alex Ferguson? Uh, they were top notch. Both of them, like always, uh, both of them's winners. You know what I mean? One's from Ireland, one from Scotland. You know what I mean? Let's say <laughs> we we uh, like we. I know what it's like. We have short temperaments and football. We want to win, and uh, uh, of course, sometimes you're going to clash in football uh, in training grounds. That's the way football was when I was playing. But uh, the thing is now, it's just uh, probably left in the sorrow note what I've, what I've read over the papers. But when I was there, Roy Keane and Sir Alex, were, he was the captain. He was the engine of the team. And Sir Alex was always spoke to him. And, and uh, Sir Alex always respected Roy Keane because he was the leader of the, leader of the team. And uh, uh, you can see that when Roy Keane played, he was 100% giving everything he can for the team and for the coaching staff because that's it's a team game. Uh, as I said before, Manchester United was like a family club and everybody from, from the cleaners the whole way up to Sir Alex was all in together. That's interesting that you talk about um, Sir Alex not taking the, not taking the, the trainings. Um, I mean, he, must, he obviously had a fantastic staff around him. I mean, Tony, I think Tony Cotton was there, as, was your goalkeeper trainer when you were there. Um, and was it, was it, that was before Rene Mjolnstein. Uh, who, who, was the, who was his assistant manager at the time? Carlos Quelos came in. Carlos first Quilos. year he came in. When, when, he, when he first came in, we won the league. We won the league when he first came in. He, he, uh, he lifted the level at Manchester United even further because it's where, it was where the football was turning out to be. He was a very clever coach. And uh, 
So Alex always had a good number two, Brian Kidd, you know what I mean? Uh, Stephen McLaren, they've got, he always had a good number two. I think mm-hmm. that's very important. You have to have a good guy behind you to help you be in between the, in between the, the players on the pitch and uh, on the staff. Right. Um, interesting. Uh, I, Carlos Churros, I think he left Manchester United to be the head coach at Real Madrid. So that shows you how good of a, how good of a, uh, of a coach he was, right? Um, yeah. While, while you're at United, uh, you played with Tim Howard, who is uh, the best ever American goalkeepers. I mean, there's always competition, uh, competition between uh, the two of you during your time at United, but did you, did you enjoy working, working with him? Obviously, he was the most accomplished player to come out of the United States at this point. Tim Howard, uh, when he came in, like, uh, we got on really well. He's a really, really nice lad. He came in from America, and uh, I've seen a different level to goalkeeping. Uh, um, he was so agile. He was, uh, he was like, he, he could jump, he spring on him. He was unbelievable. And uh, he was very strong, really, really strong. We got on really well. I always got on with my goalkeepers. Might have, may, maybe over my career, over 21 years of my career, I probably never liked two or three keepers, you know what I mean? But that's, that's not bad. Yeah, that's not bad. That's not bad, but that's not bad all the teams I've been at. But uh, Tim Howard was one of the best I've, I've worked with because me and him worked the, the, the same. We, we worked hard. We worked hard in training. And Tony Colton was uh, our goalkeeping coach, like you said. And uh, in them days, it was like you do a lot of reps, a lot of reps, a lot of hard work. And uh, whoever played, we were, I, I gave him a pat in the back. If I played, he gave me a pat in the back. And that's right. what it was like. I hated not playing, but we, we've only got one position and, and it's very difficult. But I would like if I was playing, Tim Howard has my back and, and he did. And uh, that's why we're a very close unit as a goalkeeper mm-hmm. all over the world. That's why over here in Europe, I think hopefully to do it in America, keep his union. We stick together. We have yeah. to stick together. Yeah. Um, staying on, staying on that. The you know, I think the greatest export of American players to Europe uh, in the last two decades, anyways, it's changing now a bit. Um, was was American goalkeepers, right? We we saw so many um, Americans uh, be successful in in especially in the Premier League. Um, a, why do you think that is? And, and B, it seems like it seems like that isn't the case anymore. And, you know, we have more field players, uh, players that are playing out on the pitch that are, that are successful and, and less goalkeepers. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's probably one of those situations, Mike, is like you have a, you had Brad Friedel, uh, Casey Keller, Keller. Casey yeah, yeah. yeah, he, he would, you know, I mean, you had two Brad keepers Guzan. who came from America. Yeah, you had two keepers, that, three keepers come to England. Coaches say, "Well, oh, these guys are quite decent. Let's look, let's look further afield in America, see what way they're working, and see if we can get any more keepers come across." Uh, it could be that. Who, who, who knows? You know what I mean? It's just it's like anything. My our country in Northern Ireland, we had a few keepers come out of our country. It's a small country. We had the likes of Tommy Wright who played at Newcastle, Man City. I came out when I was a young lad, but uh, you you probably not know these keepers like, but Alan Fettis as well played in a high level in English league. But sometimes it's just Scouts don't really go somewhere else. They might go to Germany, they might go to Spain, they probably go to Brazil now because of Liverpool keeper who, who's doing really well at Liverpool. The pop's yeah. got a lot of keepers in Brazil. It's just the way football is. It goes in a it goes in a big circle. Uh, you may you may have another keeper comes out of America in the next two years and he's unbelievable, right. and people will say, "Oh, can we, can we find another guy? Can we find another goalkeeper in America?" Uh, that's just my opinion. It could be a diff- completely different story, but. That's just what, what I've noticed over the years. It just happens all the time. Yeah, no, it makes sense because you, you see so many of these, like, like you said, the, the goalkeepers in the Premier League from America. Now in the German, the Bundesliga and the Bundesliga too, there's so many young Americans coming through the, over there and they're, they're, they're bringing over more and more Americans. And it's, it's interesting to see that, that trend. I think you're right. It is a trend. I got a question here. Um, as a coach, do you have any advice of how to work with a player who has lost their confidence? How do you strengthen the mental strength of a goalkeeper? Yeah, that's um, that's, fair. that's that's one of those situations. The confidence is a big, big thing as a goalkeeper. Very big thing to have as a goalkeeper. So, uh, I was talking to my friend about it the other day, and uh, when I was playing, I I lost my confidence a few times. It's football; you will do, but you might make a save in training, or you might make a save in a in a match, but builds that confidence back. Uh, that's that's the thing. What I'm doing in Northern Ireland is by by coaching these young keepers by giving them confidence in, in themselves because that's the most important thing uh, as a coach you have to understand the player 
and uh, it, it, then it's up to the player if they can get over these bad bad mistakes or whatever they go through. I've made plenty of mistakes in high profile games. I think everybody knows about my problems in high profile games, but the way I, the, the person I am, I'm completely different. I just it bounces off my chin and you get on with it and you move on. Uh, because if you keep thinking about the bad things, you, you never back, walk back on the pitch. So the confidence is a big, big thing. And the, the question that is you keep working on the keeper's confidence by uh, by talking to him and giving him belief in himself. It's all about belief. Give him belief and uh, just build his confidence back up again. Yeah. Um, I, I, the goalkeeper position is such a pressured position. And then when you add 40,000 or Old Trafford at the time, I think 67,000 people um, there watching you. I and mean, that must be – confidence has to be the, the number one thing, right? I mean, it sounds uh, – I, 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 I know you might, la- you might laugh at this, thing, Meg, but when I was more nervous sitting on the bench than I was playing because you're focused, more focused. You're more focused because you just concentrate on what's gonna, what you're going to be doing in the game, what you're just thinking. So when you're playing at Old Trafford, my first time thinking, what am I going to do when I'm going to be playing at Old Trafford in front of 65,000 people? But when that day came, when that day came, I just, I can't remember it. You know what I mean? It was just so, I wasn't even thinking about the fans. But when I, if I was sitting on the bench, you're more relaxed a little bit, but you're not too relaxed because you're still concentrating. You have to be prepared in the right, right way. But you're watching around what's happening around in the, in, the, in the game and what's happening. You can hear more about the fans. But when you're playing, it's, it's, you're just tunnel vision. You talk, you're, you're looking, you're concentrating, working with your teammates in, in the game. And, and that's it. Like, and then, you go home and watch the game. And you're thinking, "What happened there? How did that happen?" You know what I mean? It's it's, right. it's one of those it's one of those situations that your your brain works in different ways when you play than you do sitting on the bench. Right. Interesting. Um, I have a actually this is a good segue into that. Uh, we got a good question here, um, talking about the uh, the famous game at Highbury um, with Roy mm-hmm. Keane and Patrick Vieira, the the tunnel incident. You're obviously right there, but that that entire game that's one of the most famous games in Premier League history, right? The, the Titans coming together and playing for the, for the title. What was, what was first of all, what happened in the tunnel? And secondly, playing in that, in that game. And I think uh, John O'Shea scored a chip with his left foot even. Like, <laughs> yeah, John, John O'Shea didn't know, John <laughs> O'Shea didn't know how to celebrate as well. He just said yeah, right. seconds. But no, uh, coming to, uh, it was Highbury. I love playing at Highbury because it was a small, the old English grounds, very close to fans, are very close to the, to the pitch. But, even the tunnel was even smaller. It was really hard to walk down. And uh, we, well, I, was, I was at the front with Roy Keane. Next minute, we heard a little scuffle at the back. Uh, Roy Keane walks up as he does. He's the leader. He's the, he's the captain. And um, he just looked around. And next minute, all, all I heard was Vera and Roy Keane having a go at each other. Roy Keane was saying, he's my player. Leave him alone. And all that kind of stuff. I, I better not what, what else he said, but I can't say that because yeah, nobody's yeah. listening. But... Uh, but anyhow, we, we got down, the, them two just walked down, the, they, were still, they were still shouting at each other. It was like husband and wife shouting at each other, coming down the tunnel. And um, I couldn't believe it. I was 24 at the time, I remember it clearly. I said to Roy, Roy King uh, to calm down. And then I thought to myself, what am I saying? He's Roy King. <laughs> <laughs> He's Roy King. And I was saying to him to calm down. But see that, see that game? That game started once we walked out through the changing rooms. That yeah. game started when we walked through the change rooms. That was, uh, I always say, Roy Keane, we won that game because what happened in the tunnel, because we were so fired up to that, after that day incident. And um, it, was, uh, it was some experience. I think it's probably one of the best games I ever, probably is one of the best games I've ever played in and ever seen because 4-2 at Highbury. It's Unbelievable. The good thing about uh, them games, them as well, uh, the, uh, the early 2000, mid-2000, Arsenal and Man U, it was always a battle, always a battle, even between the two managers, yeah. building up to the game, building up to the game. Ferguson, Sir Alex, and uh, and uh, Arsenal uh, Banger, he we always have them go at each other in the press, and that's that, that's I loved it. I loved it. It's just you couldn't wait to get on the pitch and, and win the game if you can. You always go out and try and win the game, but sometimes you come away from defeat, which is a horrible place to leave when when you lose. But Lucky enough, we didn't. I didn't lose too many games at the uh, Highbury. Yeah, what? Um, I remember. I think Ronaldo scored twice that game as well. He did the he did the the shush oh. to, the, to the behind the net, which is fantastic to the Arsenal supporters. What? Um, Sir Alex Ferguson in those in those circumstances, like you talk about, obviously having the 
you know, before the game leading up, it was always the press wars are going back and forth and, and jabbing each other and the mind games and stuff. But at halftime of that match, so intense, is, is Sir Alex in there? Is he, is he trying to get everyone worked up and keep them going? Or is he telling everyone to calm down? Is it all tactical stuff? How, how did he manage those situations? I'll tell you a wee story. Uh, we were 3-0 down against Spurs. I can't remember what year it was, but we were 3-0 down. And so Alex walked in. And I don't think he said anything. I can't remember if he said it. He walked in, walked back out, and that was it. We went on win that game 5-3. That was against Spurs. We went on win that game 5-3. We scored five goals in the second half. Ferguson sometimes doesn't have to say anything. He doesn't have to say anything. But in that game, he said a few things. He said a few things to just get the guys going again. But the players already had it all up and ready to go anyhow because we wanted to win. We were playing right. against uh, Arsenal, who's our rivals. So the players were ready for it. Even and even in, that's what he was like as a manager because when he walks in, everybody's quiet like I was saying before. And uh, and, and he, he had um, he is a big stature. He's a big stature in, in the change rooms, and sometimes he doesn't say much. You know what I mean? Uh, I was uh, I was I was going to go on another story. I was more worried about coming off the pitch when I let that goal against Spurs in uh, because yep. I thought I was going to get the hair dryer treatment that time. Yeah. How uh, yeah? What, was, was how did Mr. Alex react to that? Did he? Did he what, was he? No. Um. It took, it took me about ten minutes walking off the pitch because I didn't want to go in the change rooms. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want to go in the change rooms. So uh, my, the situation was, I just it took me a good ten minutes to walk off the pitch. No doubt. I'm, I'm not joking here. I'm being serious. But ten ten minutes to walk off. Uh, the goalkeeping coach was waiting for me at the bottom of the tunnel. We walked up. Uh, we walked up and uh, went into the change rooms and I put my head down. I was annoyed with myself, but we were still nil nil. It wasn't a goal, it was nil nil, so it wasn't too bad. And right. uh, and uh, he said, What happened? And I just said, Boss, like I took my eye off the ball. I, I was trying to throw, thinking about throwing the ball to Gary Neville. And he said, To be fair, Roy, good, good reaction uh, because I never stopped, I carried on and, and stopped it before I went over the line. Right. Yeah, <laughs> very good. No, that's uh, that's that's good management from Sir Alex. Um, a question came in. A uh, question for Roy: You had a dream debut with Olympiacos in the Europa League during your time in Greece, when you came off the bench and saved a penalty. What was it like to play for Ernesto Valverde in terms of one tactics and two his man management? Great story. A great question. Oh, what a what a great question that is. Uh, what a manager. What a coach. He's the type of, uh, he was a manager and coach as well at the same time. His coaching was unbelievable. Uh, we probably only trained about 40 minutes on the training field. It's short and sweet, but very quick. Very quick, very sharp, like same as uh, the early days at Man U. But uh, playing and uh, coming off the bench for the last 15 minutes in Moscow when it was minus 13, I don't know. Uh, it was very cold anyhow. It was very, very cold. And uh, I didn't realise how big I was going to be after making that penalty save. Especially the Olympiagos fans, they're fantastic. Uh, they were fantastic to me. And uh, I went back to Greece the next day, went in training. And uh, on the way to training ground, everybody was waving at me and shouting my name. And it was uh, some experience. Um, but uh, the coaching staff as well, uh, he, went on to be, he went on to be the Barcelona manager there. So he was uh, for about three years. And I knew he could have made it big time because he, he was really good with the players as well. It was very hard for me and him because he couldn't speak, I couldn't speak Spanish and he couldn't speak uh, much English. But uh, we got used to it and, and we grew uh, together and it was really, really good how we, how we got on together as a, as, as a team, especially when you're playing in Greece, when you have so many different languages coming back because you had a translator who translated to me in English. But it would go through about three different language languages, yeah. And uh, that's the only thing I missed from the manager because I always love to see the manager's passion when he speaks. When when uh, it comes to me, the passion's not there now because it's another person saying the translation. So it was just one of those things where I would love to hear what he was saying out of his own mouth. I wish yeah. I could learn Spanish, uh, go out and learn Spanish, and go back again with him because he he was very he was very highly reckoned uh, by the by the staff and and uh, the president and the Biagos really liked him and uh, he won a lot of trophies there when he was there interesting and your your relationship obviously a goalkeeper and and the goalkeeper trainer the goalkeeper coach always is a strong relationship what 
Uh, who is your favorite goalkeeper coach? I mean, wh what, what club were you at that had the best one? I see the best one I would have said, uh, I said, I always said a Greek one. He was the best. I, I learned more from the great goalkeeping coach as well, but I'm not the rest of the goalkeeping coaches. I always learned something from them. Tony Colton, uh, he was pretty fair, uh, at 23 years old. That was my first goalkeeping coach I was having day in and day out. So I wasn't having full time goalkeeping training until I was. Uh, 23 years old and when I went to Manchester United so wow. it was uh, I was quite old when I started getting full-time goalkeeping training Tony Colton taught me a lot but I learned from everybody that's what I'm saying I picked up a lot of different ideas of every coach I pe uh, uh, every goalkeeping coach I worked with but uh, the great goalkeeping coach uh, was I, I went to Greece and the great goalkeeping coach he was uh it's the way it is now. He was preparing for the game, what the team who we were playing against on the Saturday, if you know what I mean, Mike. Uh, he was working towards, say, the ball comes in the pitch, comes down the line, crosses, might do more crosses that week than we would do the next week if it was just shooting, if the other team shoots outside the bar. Years ago, it was just, you do volleys, you do half volleys, do turns off the post, and uh, you mentally work hard, prepare hard, and you play the game on a Saturday. Right. Uh, I remember, I remember I was coming off the training ground, she's geez, I'm tired, I'm, I'm, I'm completely wrecked. And then the game comes on a Saturday, so I can't wait for the game on Saturday. I just want to play this game on a Saturday because you work so hard during the week uh, and the game comes on a Saturday and you're ready to go. But uh, in 2011, 2012, that's when the goalkeeping coaching was changing when I was still playing at the time. Uh, I could be wrong in some parts of the world, but for me, when I was playing... That's when it changed for me. And uh, I learned a lot, no doubt about it. I learned a lot from him as well. I was 33 at the time, 34 at the time, I think I was. And I was still wanted to learn. And that's what type of person I was. I wanted to learn from everybody. Right. Uh, another question in here. Uh, as a coach, I feel we overcoach, taking away the imagination of the player. How do you get across your points by not overcoaching? Uh, and a side note, it says apologies for scoring on you at the I I F IFA course from Shea Whelan. <laughs> I let that one and tell him. <laughs> okay. Brilliant. <laughs> no, no, he's got a point. Uh, we we can't overcoach. Sometimes uh, I'm I'm trying I'm trying. Um, I tell you, I've opened a goalkeeping school here in Northern Ireland in August, and uh, I'm I'm open specialist crew and I'm actually sitting around. You're thinking what you're going to be doing. The last six weeks, I've been thinking a lot, and I think we need to let keepers try and coach themselves sometimes as well, but give them advice and uh, give them advice. Like, you know what I mean? We need, as coaches, this is my opinion, was uh, don't keep going in. Don't keep going in. Don't give them, just let them get on with it and let them learn, see if they can learn themselves. If they can't learn themselves, that's when you go in and speak to them again. And uh, that's the way I, I would like to, to work with my keepers in the future. By, because in a game, your coach can't stand beside you, can he? Coach can't stand beside you, so you, they have to learn themselves and in uh, in uh, coaching sessions as well, because that's where you learn. Why why do we train for? Why do we train? We train because uh, you work on your weak points, you you work on your strength, and you work on your weakness. You do more reps on your weakness than you would do on your strength uh, strength uh, side of the game. So that's what we do for training. You you, you coach them in training, and. Uh, step in once in a while and make sure they're doing the right technique because technique's a big thing in goalkeeping. For me Absolutely. personally, uh, technique was the biggest thing for goalkeeper, especially at any age as well because you have to teach kids so many different things. You coach them over over a year, it's not enough. Like I'm 42 years old and I'm still learning the game. Interesting. Very cool. Um, uh, another great question. Uh, there have been hypothetical talks in the media about this. Over uh, other sports combined, the Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland, what are your thoughts of the United Ireland national team? And where do you think they would rank? Oh, well, I, I don't know. It's like saying England and Scotland or England and Wales. Like, we've got our country. For me, I, I just because I, I end up playing in the Irish League. I end up playing in the Irish League, and I really enjoyed it, playing in the Irish League. Uh, it's, it's, I don't know. What, what would you like uh, if you end up... Uh, uh, playing in the South American League, you know what I mean, Brazil. It's, I don't, it's one of those situations. I don't think it will, for me personally, I wouldn't like it to happen. But you don't know what's going to happen in football, especially in this island of Ireland, you know what I mean? 
it's uh, Northern Ireland and Republic of Ireland. It's it's uh, it's a situation like, would it work? Could we do it? To try to do like a cup game of, about four or five years ago. So you're playing Northern Ireland, uh, Northern Ireland teams against whoever wins the league. Mm-hmm. We play the teams down down in uh, Southern Ireland. So uh, it's good to have that because you see how much more you have to work on if if you can grow. It's like I played for Linfield. I don't know if you heard of the team Linfield and Belfast. Yeah, of course. We played set. I came home and I thought, okay, like nice, let's relax a little bit. Now we're playing part time football. We end up playing Celtic in the Champions League qualifying games in front of fifty thousand people, and people in the Irish League would never be able to play in that, uh, play in that ever again. They might not play that. So once in a lifetime, it's great achievement for them players. But uh, I can't see, I can't see for me, not in my lifetime, I can't see it happening. Uh, both both leagues coming together. I don't think so. Gotcha. Um... What is the best advice uh, you have been given from a coach to you as a player? And to flip it, if you were to give any advice to us as coaches, what would that be? Well, the coach said, the coach said to me, one coach said to me, which I, which I thought, oh, wow. Uh, he said, the best keeper is the one who doesn't have to touch the ball. And I realized what he was on about is the one who gives more information. Of course, we're going to have to touch the ball, don't we? But uh, I think it's quite good what he was saying. Um, and that was my great goalkeeping coach. He was saying, it's the goalkeeper who, it's, it's the goalkeeper who doesn't have to touch the ball, the ball much because you are giving good information to your back line. And organising is the most, thing, the most important thing as a goalkeeper as well. I think, we've, I think some, some teams, some keepers have moved away from that part of the world by giving information uh, in, in the game. And uh, what's the advice for me to give to a keeper? It's, it's your attitude in training, the attitude in training. Uh, you have to be open-minded as a goalkeeper to learn from everybody. Because I, I did, and I just think, personally, I think it's a good idea. You might not agree with coaches sometimes, but I remember I had a technique, the, the save, when you put your arm across to make a save top corner, uh, the top hand. I, could never, I never liked that. But we, we did it in Greece. we done it in Greece. And about four months down the line, I, I played a game, made a save, and I'd done that save, and I thought, oh, it, it works, you know what I mean? Right. So you always have an open mind as a goalkeeper. But my advice is, the, the big one is there, it's just a good attitude. You, a lot of young goalkeepers don't realise how hard it is, how hard work it is to be a goalkeeper. And you have to have a, just that attitude is the big thing. Training is, you don't just stand in goals, you work hard, trust me. Right. Right. How much, how much does like a, a tactical analysis or game match analysis, you, you know, maybe it's on an iPad or, or some sort of, some sort of video um, analysis that do, do goalkeepers do now uh, at the, at the professional leagues? It's got big. It's got very big. Like I, I played from a country there, Northern Ireland, just coming up to the Euros in 2016. It was, it was big then. Uh, I think we were, we we were doing penalty shootouts for the for the Euros, and uh, me and the two other goalkeepers who was in the squad that, that two nights before the team we were playing, like say Poland or it could have been all the teams we were played against, in case it went to penalties, we had every single player in that squad. Uh, you say say Poland team, and we watched their penalties, and the penalties could have been from five years before. You know what I mean? So. The technology is there now. Why not use it? Why not use it? And uh, and uh, in Northern Ireland, we did use it. I left when I when I came back from Greece. I moved to Notts County. So the uh, in the lower leagues of England, they haven't got that. Uh, uh, they haven't got as much money as the higher leagues. So what do you do? You go on Google, check, put the name on the player's name, check on Google, see if there's any any penalties or any free kicks. It, you might as well use it because the technology is there. I think it will help you in the long run. Yeah, it helped me anyhow. It helped me to play even further in my career because it, it, you get you, you have a you always a half a step in front of the player because it, you then you can watch him and see what way he can cut inside. Does he cut inside? Does he cut down the line? What where's the ball going to come in? Uh, penalty shootouts. Uh, it's I think I made more penalty saves in my last five years than than I did in my whole career because of the technology. Interesting. Interesting. Um, uh, another question here. Is the character within player selection and recruitment critical and who came to Manchester United? 
when I was, I knew it was, it was a big, big thing. Uh, so Alex always had to say he was coming in. Uh, he, he's, he was the boss. Uh, football's changed. Changed, I don't know if it's going to be in the good way or bad way, but football has changed. You've got directors of football now. You have other things involved in football now. So uh, for me, the manager who picks the team every week should be in charge who's going to come in and who's not going to come in. And he, he had that. He had that uh, because he had he had the power to do that because he's won a lot of trophies. Yeah. His first two three his first two or three years of his career as Man United, uh, he he struggled, but a lot of people say, "What would he be like now if he came in as a manager starting off?" I think it'd be very hard for most managers coming in because a success you need you need to win games to win you need to win trophies you need to win. Mourinho got sacked from Man U. He's one of the best managers in the world as well, and he got sacked. Mm. Never thought that 15 years ago he would have been sacked. Yeah, it's so true. Um, what do you think is the biggest thing that separates football from Europe um, and football in America? That's hard for me to say because I haven't. I nearly went to America. I nearly went to FC Dallas, but I never played in America. I watched it in I watched it in Sky, uh, Sky over here. I watched it and. It's just uh, I spoke to a few people who's played over in America, and they said there's a lot of traveling to do. Right. So players out, out the, uh, in America, it's like you probably I don't know if this is true, but I've heard something, one of the boys was saying they might go and play two games in, in four days or something. I don't know if that's true, Mike. But but after I think it looks to me like the MLS, some players are very tired midway through the season. I don't know because of the heat, because of the heat as well. Because I remember when I went to Greece. Uh, it took me a year to get to get used to the football in Greece because of the weather was completely hot. Right. In modern than it's always nice and wet over here, so <laughs> nice and cold. So uh, uh, to, to move to move to play in Greece and playing in a really really hot weather, it was a slow pace. So uh, when uh, when you play in Europe, it's a lot faster. Especially we had Veron that came to Man U, great player, unbelievable player. Uh, but in in England, he couldn't handle it because the, the pace was far, far quicker. And that's the main land. You're playing in Italy, which is only a two-hour flight to come to England. So the difference between even in Europe, playing in England and Italy, Spain, is completely different. So every country you're playing is going to, going to be completely different. And that's the other thing. How do you get goalkeepers to prepare, prepare for each country? Because you don't know where these keepers are going to go to, uh, especially if you have a goalkeeping school like I have. So I'm preparing them no matter what in life, what hits you, you have to really overcome that and try and work on it and do it yourself. And the guy who asked that question before, I don't know his name, but that's the asked him saying you have to let him try and learn himself as well sometimes. Right. Um, no, I think, I think you're right. There's been a, a lot of high profile players that have come over to play in major league soccer. Um, Wayne Rooney, obviously being the most recent one who's been pretty critical of our, of the system and the way that, um, uh, the way that Major League Soccer handles young American talent, as opposed to as opposed to well, Wayne Rooney even said it that you know he's semi retired and he's making so much more money and not rightly so than these than these young Americans who are coming through that deserve to get paid and and just to to grow the sport in the United States and all this money's getting getting dumped into the likes of Zlatan, with, who's still proven himself to be pretty handy in Europe. But uh, for the most part, all these players are coming over for retirement. So it's been it's been a positive move, I think, bringing these players over just because they're being outspoken about the system. And hopefully things will change here. We're already seeing it, Roy, on the youth level from the Federation. Um, yeah, there's there's, there's well, a lot of changes. But uh, but that's it's every country. It's, it comes from youth development. It's all, it's, you have to give the youth a chance. Uh, England England does it. England FA gives a lot of money to the youth set up growing. <coughs> around England uh, but uh, they trust the youth and uh, I think it was a few years ago when England on the 17s 19s and 20s and 23s they won everything because of the strength of the youth team but then what happens with them youth team players where do they go to the Premier League the Premier League uh, um, uh, top top flight football in England this happens in England if you bring too many many overseas players it's very hard for young British players to, to make it in mainland uh, England and that's why I always say to people because I never thought I'd be in Greece never thought I'd be in Denmark when I was 16, 17, 18 years old but right. things happen for a reason and I, I end up moving these countries so and, 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 and that's the big that's the big attitude for young people have to understand 
don't be scared to move anywhere else in life because the opportunity in, in football is a big, massive thing. But I think if you can, can develop the young players in America, I was over in January uh, and I was doing a few uh, coaching uh, coaching things up in uh, Detroit and I really enjoyed the hunger for the young young keepers. Young keepers, I really enjoyed it and I could see them looking up at me, asking me 101 questions and what's it like in Europe, what's it like there. I says, do, try it in America, work it in America and build yourself in America. Stay in America as long as you can until you move on somewhere else because same as Northern Ireland, we have some young, good young players that goes to England at 16, 17 years old. They come back after two years because they haven't made it in England. And they're completely broke. So it's difficult for them. Uh, so if you're not strong enough, why not wait and learn your trade in your own country and go from there? Interesting. It's a very good point. Uh, yeah, we, we, a, lot of, a lot of us think that at a young age is to get to Europe as soon as possible because that's where the, the, the development happens. But that's a fantastic point. It's a fantastic point. Um, another one, what are your honest thoughts on VAR and goal line technology? I'm glad it wasn't around when I was playing. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't like it. I do not like it. I think it's too much now. I think it's too much. But the problem is there's so much money in the game. There's so much money in the game, so they have, they have to use it. Uh, but for me personally, it's, it's, a, it's, the, it's the supporters that make it good. Uh, I'm a, I'm a big supporter of football. I love it. I love going in. You sit in a coffee shop or a bar or wherever, sitting and talking. Oh, that referee, he should have given that. He should have done that. Uh, in England at the moment, we're talking more about the VAR than we're talking about the game. So uh, it might take a long time to get, might, might take a couple of seasons over here to get it sorted. I know they do it in the MLS. So what's it like in the MLS, Mike? Is it, is it working? Is it working? Or? No, but you know what? I think it's funny because. Um, the MLS, it, it's it's such it's getting such hard it's hard to get traction in the United States, right? If if, if you're a football fan um, in the United States, you, you want to watch you want to watch the Premier League. It's it's easier for us, you know. NBC Sports has it's easy. I've heard it's easier for us to watch Premier League games in the United States than it is for people in the UK to yeah. watch Premier League games on television, right? So we have access to an unbelievable you know platform of football. So. Um, when we talk about VAR and everything, it only really affected our lives when it came into the Premier League, right? Right or wrong, um, that's, that's just the situation. You know, we didn't think about it much at the, at the Major League Soccer level. So um, it's interesting that the power uh, that the Premier League has in the United States. I, 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 for me personally, I think there's too many rules. If, uh, even though I'll say, you know what I mean? if you're on the pitch, you're involved in the game, I think it should be offside. Uh, but the, th the, the thing in football, uh, now there's so many rules. Referees have got so many different rules. This VAR is bought out. Even a toenail, you're offside. If your toenail's offside, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's 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 a goal not given. It's I think it's too much. I think I think the what uh, for me personally, I think you want more goals in the game than than not. So if you're a little bit offside, just just carry on. I think it's just that's the way football is. Uh, but like I said before, if um, the VAR comes in the game. I think it's just gonna be, it's just gonna go on and on and on. It's gonna be different different characters in the game now. And you've got a guy sitting in a van telling making the decision. Referee, what's the point having a referee then? Because he he's on the pitch. Let him make the decision. Yeah. So, no, you I, I did it. Go on ahead. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I think I think VAR would be good. It's good in the sense where, you know, you have you have a situation where the Republic of Ireland is playing France and Thierry Henry did the, the handball and put it in the back of the net, right? And knocked Ireland out of contention for the World Cup. And uh, in that in that sense of injustice, I think VAR would have been obviously justified. Um, but the way they bring it in for, for minute decisions and yeah, the but then, rules. Yeah, you you you're all right. You're all yeah, you're, you're right there, definitely right there, 100%. That there's like, it's even my incident where I did, you know what I mean? If, that, if they had the VAR then, that was definitely, they probably said it was definitely a goal. Yeah. But uh, for me, uh, I think, how, when, when, when do you stop? What do you stop on, you know what I mean? Uh, do you yeah. stop on Dave? Uh, do you stop on, did that ball cross the line when it was up the other side of the pitch? Uh, it's just so much going on there. It's like, I'm a Liverpool player. I can't remember who playing, uh, playing somebody. They even went the whole way back about what happened 60, about 50 seconds ago and see if it was a free kick on a Liverpool player. You know what I mean? It's just so much. You can go further and further back. It's yeah. just one of those situations. I think it's, it will 
have it. We'll still keep doing it because the money involved is just so much money involved. Like Champions League football, to make in England now, it's not winning the league. It's we have to make the top four, and that's what annoys me. Uh, for me, as a footballer, you want to win the league, but right. it's not. It's, it's like who, who's going to finish the top four, and and that's that's the crying shame about the about the leagues now. It's all it's all about even the championship teams in in England. Uh, but so much money to try and get in the Premier League because it's where the big money is. It's scary. Right. Right. Interesting. Um, we got we got one more here, Roy, and I really really appreciate your time. This has been fantastic. Um, no, no problem. No problem. Uh, what was your experience like playing in Denmark and how would you compare it to the other places that you've played? Denmark brought another change in my career. It was one of those situations when I, I, I enjoyed it. The biggest thing with it was, say we played on a Saturday, we would have trained on a Sunday, but I never did this before, but we would have trained on a Sunday. Normally we have a Sunday off in England, but we played on a Sunday and then the second day was a rest day, so we would have been off on the Monday. So, and, and I enjoy, I like that because my body was always tired on a, uh, two days after the game for some reason. It wasn't straight after the game. I could have trained hard. I could have worked hard on, on a Sunday. And then the next day, because I think because Saturday night, I could never sleep because you're still so much full of energy. You couldn't sleep. And it's always the second day when, uh, when your body's still aching, your, your, your bones are weak, very achy. But uh, the style of football, it probably would be something more or less like the, the SPL in Scotland. Uh, you might have Copenhagen. Copenhagen, uh, the team I played for was OB Odense. And, uh, and you, had, uh, you, had some, you had probably four or five teams in that league who are very, very good teams. And most of them teams are now still playing the high level in the uh, Europa, yep. Europa League tournaments, which is, which is credit to the credit to the country absolutely absolutely Hopefully that answers question <laughs> no uh, yeah i i think i have an idea who who asked that he's a he's a coach in our club um who is uh, a yeah. danish <laughs> so uh anyways roy tell, I, him was, tell, him, tell him it was a lovely country a really a, it was really nice place Met, it was people were very very good like and spoke yeah. really good english by the way spoke really good english better than me i can <laughs> better english than me you know uh, we have um uh, i just uh, confirmed it yesterday or the day before fleming Pedersen and fc nordisland is is a, is a i don't know if you're familiar with oh yeah yeah that's with, another one yeah yeah they're doing incredible yeah. stuff with the right to dream in ghana and stuff so I, i'm really mm. looking forward to to hearing him and the model that fc nordisland have it's gonna be interesting it's gonna be great yeah, they've came. They've came good. They've the last six, seven years. They've got really strong. Yeah, really, really strong. Yeah. Well, Roy, um, I don't want to. I want to respect your time and everyone else's time as well. Um, I really, really appreciate you coming on here, and uh, thanks again to Troy for putting us in contact. Um, uh, this is this has been fantastic, fantastic for me running a webinar and also being a, as you can see behind me, a pretty a pretty avid Manchester United fan. Um, this has been this has been a great time. Mike, it was, a, it was a pleasure. Thanks for having me on, by the way. And uh, just keep safe, everybody in America. Take care and look after yourselves. Cheers. I appreciate it, Roy. Thanks, everyone. All the best. Bye-bye.